For our 15th wedding anniversary, uh, my wife and I, we traveled uh, overseas and we spent a few days in London. Beautiful place. I think I could probably live there. I don't know for how long, but I think I could probably live there. Uh, we, you know, I, I can talk and they can understand and uh, they can talk and I can understand. There's no language barrier. It makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but we spent a few days in London and then we spent a few days uh, in Paris. And one of the things I was very excited to see in Paris was the Eiffel Tower. I had seen so many replicas, you know, many replicas and pictures. I've even traveled to Paris, Texas. Have you seen the one in Paris, Texas? <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> uh, but it's underwhelming, actually. Uh, but I've seen it. And so it was one of the things I was really looking forward to was seeing the Eiffel Tower. And so... We uh, left our, our hotel room and we got on the underground, that's the subway there, they call it the underground, and we traveled, you know, got off and on, I think, in a couple places, and, and finally uh, ascended from under the ground, walked onto the street and turned the corner, and there it was. That's not my picture. I'll show you a picture I took in just a minute, but that's, I want to give you perspective of how grand and how large it is. And I turned the corner and I looked at it and I was absolutely amazed. It is an a, a, a architectural marvel. Absolutely amazing. It, it, I just sat there for a few minutes. We just stood there and we took it in. And, and as you get even closer, it becomes even more amazing. As you get underneath it and you see how tall it is, you see all the nuts and the bolts and all the uh, big beams of, of steel and, and you think somebody, somebody thought that in their head and they put it on paper and then they made it and constructed it and, and put all the nuts and bolts and everything in the right place and it's still standing. It's absolutely amazing. I was marveled by it. When was the last time that you marveled at something? I'm not sure it happens very often. It takes a lot to get us to, to just stop and be wowed and amazed. It takes something very special to kind of take our breath away and we just stand in amazement at whatever it may be or the, the thought of something. Well, there are two times in Scripture where we are told that Jesus marveled. Only two times when we're told that Jesus marveled. And one of those is our text uh, this evening. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. You know, there are several times in uh, the Gospels where we're told that the people marveled at Jesus. You know, they marveled at his teachings. We're told that they marveled at his miraculous abilities. We're told that, you know, I think it's in John chapter 4, that the disciples were marveled that Jesus stopped and, and talked at the woman at the well. There are several times in the Gospels that we're told that the people marveled at Jesus, but only two times. Only two times where we're told that Jesus is marveled. Luke highlights, um, I think part of his purpose uh, of writing is to highlight as he writes this uh, gospel account to Theophilus that Jesus came to save both Jew and Gentile. And we're told in our account this evening of a Gentile, a Roman centurion who made Jesus uh, marvel. The faith of this centurion seems to, to foreshadow, I think a little bit later in, in the uh, uh, book 2 of Luke, which we call Acts. He wrote both of them. In his second uh, part of, of his book, he writes about the faith of a centurion we, known at, we know as Cornelius, uh, the first Gentile in his family to obey the gospel. Maybe uh, perhaps the, the faith of this centurion foreshadows that uh, to some degree. There are some, seem to be some likenesses uh, there. But let's read Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. 
After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, this is Jesus, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they had come to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Now Jesus has just wrapped up uh, some preaching. If you look prior to this, uh, it appears that Jesus... um, I don't know if it's another version of the Sermon on the Mount or it's just what Luke decides to record of the Sermon on the Mount. There may be some debate to that because there's a lot of similarities of what Jesus said you find in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Whether it's Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount or not, I guess that could probably be debated. But I suppose that at any time that Jesus is, is teaching or preaching... Uh, He's probably using words that he used in the Sermon on the Mount. They encompassed a lot of everything that Jesus talked about. But he finishes up some preaching, and he goes into the city of Capernaum. And as soon as he walks in, at some point, he's met by some Jewish elders that have been commissioned by this centurion. And the centurion sends these gentlemen to Jesus to say, Hey, uh, he has this servant who he highly values. I don't know where he fits into the household or what it was about him, but this was somebody that was very important. Maybe they had become very good friends. Maybe he played a very important role in how the household worked and kept working uh, as a servant. But either way, he was highly valued by this Roman centurion. And he had heard about Jesus, and so he sends the one that he had heard about and his ability to heal and asks him to come to his house and heal his servant. And these Jewish uh, elders, they not only ask Jesus, we're told that they plead with him, they beg him, please come heal this man's servant. And they give reasons why. He says that this man, this centurion, is a worthy man, loves our nation. Matter of fact, he's the one that had our place of worship, the synagogue built for us. So we have a place to go and worship God because of this man. And the whole thing, when you think about it, is a little bit odd because I don't think Roman centurions were, um, I don't think they made it a point to be in favor with the Jews very often. You know, they were kind of at odds with that. The Jews didn't look on them very favorably. The uh, Romans didn't look on the Jews very favorably. But there was something that had happened here that, that had formed a relationship. I would say, as they said, this is, this is a good man. Uh, he seems to love people, even his enemies, uh, to some degree. And so they begged Jesus to come to this centurion's house and heal his servants. And having just preached about loving his enemies, Jesus practices what he preaches, and he goes with these men and comes, and as he's uh, approaching the house, the centurion sends another delegate of guys, uh, seems to be friends, and says, hey, you don't even have to come into the house. Uh, I understand how authority works. And he seems to think Jesus is a man of great authority. And he says, if you'll just speak the word, I know that my servant will be healed. And and, and as Jesus is talking with these men, it would have been the same as speaking with 
uh, the centurion. That's how much authority that these men had that he, he sent. And so when Jesus hears these words, that the centurion believed that if Jesus would just say the word, be healed. He turned and he looks at the crowd and he's marveled. And he says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus believed, or excuse me, the centurion believed that when Jesus spoke, things happened. Don't they? We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have a whole record of when Jesus speaks, things happen. And he had heard of this. I don't know if he had witnessed this to some degree or, you know, how many stories had gotten back to him about Jesus healing the sick uh, and even raising the dead, perhaps, that he believed that if Jesus would just speak, it'll happen. And Jesus marvels. He's amazed. And so he said the words, and the centurion's servant was healed. Jesus marvels at this man's faith. And I personally believe, when we read in Scripture, if it ever tells us that God marvels at something, we better stop and pay attention. If you can cause the Creator to marvel, we better stop and look and pay attention and take into account what has just happened to cause Jesus, the Son of God, to marvel. Luke chooses the word. I'm going to butcher this because I'm not a, a Greek guy by any word, by any means. Through madzo. And it means to be amazed, astonished, or wowed by something that takes place. And this was Jesus' response to the centurion's faith. There's only one other time that this word is used. It's the second, or the other time, that Jesus is marveled. And it's, again, in response to faith. But, it's in response to a lack of faith of the people of Nazareth when they didn't believe in the ability of Jesus. There are two times when Jesus is marveled. One of those, that we're just looking at tonight, he marvels at those who believe when it's not expected that they would. But he's also marveled at those who disbelieve when there's every reason to believe. Because the people of Nazareth knew Jesus best. They knew him better than anybody else. They had, walked, they had watched him grow up from his youth. And they knew that there was something different about him. But still, there was a lack of faith. You know, Jesus says a, a prophet's uh, not without honor except in his own town. And he's marveled by their lack of faith. And he goes somewhere else. In this text, we have a, a wonderful account of a man causing God to marvel. The creation causes the creator to marvel. The creator is marveled by the creation. And when you stop and think about it, it's amazing, isn't it? It's incredible that God would marvel at anything. Think about it for just a minute. What could any of us do to mar or, or, or amaze the one who caused the blind to see? What could we do to cause the, the one uh, who caused the deaf to hear to be amazed? What is there anything that we could do to marvel the one who created all things and even raises the dead? What could we do? To make him marvel. No preacher, myself included, could preach a sermon so eloquent that God would be wowed by it. No Bible scholar could, could display such knowledge and understanding to cause the Creator to marvel. No architect, as beautiful as this building is, no architect could build a, a building so amazing and so beautiful and so... so Amazing that God would stop and just marvel. No Christian, none of us, could ever perform a deed so sacrificial that it would just cause God 
to stand in amazement. But we learn that there's one thing that will catch the attention of God and cause Him to marvel. Faith. Faith. And I believe the same thing happens today. A genuine faith that acts causes God to stand in amazement. Think about that for a minute. It doesn't have to be a, a great display, I don't think. I don't think it has to be the biggest thing that the world has ever done. But if you just stop and think about it, when we act in faith, it causes God to marvel. A genuine, dependent, action-generating faith caused the Son of God to marvel. The centurion, as far as we know, we don't know if he was a disciple or not. He had not performed any miracles. He hadn't planted any churches. He was not a Bible scholar. He didn't, he didn't possess a religious uh, title. His spiritual resume was unimpressive, but he had faith. And his faith caused Jesus to marvel. I'm going to look at his faith for a minute. A faith that marvels. I think there's, there's four things we're going to look at this evening very quickly. And I think even today that we can possess that causes God to marvel. Number one, a faith that marvels is motivated by love. The centurion, we're told, loved the Jewish people. He acted on that love. He, he had built them a, a synagogue, a place of worship, a place that they could go and offer their worship to God. We, we see that uh, the, the very reason that he sins for Jesus is because he had a servant that he loved. The text says highly valued, but I think, I think we can, can say that's the same thing. He didn't just say highly value him. This was somebody that, that he loved. This was somebody in his household that he took care of, that he provided for. And now this gentleman is sick to the point of death, and he wants to do everything that he can to, to heal him, to see that he gets well, to see that he's still part of, of his family. And so he's a fa it's a faith motivated by love. This man possessed a love that, that seemed to cross social and even racial boundaries. Could that be said of me? Could it be said of you? Could that kind of love and faith be said of us at the Woodland Oaks Church? Jesus is looking for a faith that crosses boundaries, a faith that acts, a faith that is motivated by love. That's a faith that causes Jesus to marvel. Number two, a faith that marvels is one that causes us to intercede for others. The centurion went to Jesus on behalf of his servant, asking Jesus to come and heal him. To intercede for someone is to act or petition on behalf of another who is unable to do it for themselves. The servant laid sick at home to the point of death, unable to do anything for himself, and, or, or excuse me, the centurion's servant. And so the centurion acts on that. And he intercedes on his behalf and goes to Jesus by way of uh, the Jewish elders and then some other friends of his. And he intercedes. And he asks Jesus to help. A few years ago, several years ago, uh, I attended a, a court proceeding for a young man uh, that I was trying to help. I talked to his lawyer, and his lawyer said it was probably a good idea if I was able uh, to be there on his behalf, and so I was. And when he was called up before the judge, I was just sitting, you know, back and, and watching everything and listening and uh, just there for support of some kind. And then the lawyer goes, I see him go up to the judge and kind of whispers to her, and they turn around and look at me, uh, and then the judge motions for me to come forward, and I was, I was not ready for this, but calls me to come forward, and she talks to me a little bit, and, and asks me a few things, and I was able to intercede on this young man's behalf, someone who was, was really in a helpless situation. There wasn't much that he was going to be able to do for himself, but I was 
able and asked to intercede on his behalf. That's exactly what this centurion does. That's what God is asking us to do as we love on others, is to intercede for them. Do what we can to help them come to a knowledge of who Jesus is. And we act out of faith. So faith that marvels causes us to intercede on the behalf of others. Jesus is looking for us to help others. A faith that marvels, number three, is clothed with humility. The Jews come to Jesus and they tell him that this man, this centurion, that he's a worthy man. He's a worthy man. But as Jesus gets closer to his house, remember what he says? I'm not worthy of this. I'm not worthy. I don't want to presume that you can just come in, into my house. I'm not worthy of this. Here's a, here's a man who has a hundred soldiers under his command. He knows the thing about authority. And people that hold that much authority typically aren't humble people. But here's a man clothed with humility. And he says, Jesus, I don't, I'm not even worthy of you coming to my house. Just say the word and it will be sufficient. The man viewed himself as insignificant in the presence of Jesus and even in the presence of others. And this, this humility is what, in, in, to some degree, makes his faith so remarkable. As he didn't have a, a high view of himself, or at least, a, we can say, a prideful view of himself. He knew that Jesus was the one that could help. And so clothed with humility... He says, I understand how authority it works, and you have authority. I don't have. I understand authority, but I don't have this kind of authority. You speak, things happen. Jesus is looking for a faith that exalts him and not ourself. A faith that marvels is one that is clothed with humility. And last this evening, a faith that marvels Genuinely trust in Jesus' ability. The centurion knew something about authority and apparently saw something very, very different about the authority of Jesus. Here's a man, a traveling preacher. Uh, we're, we're told in the Gospels is, is pretty much homeless. Many times Jesus said he didn't even have anywhere to lay his head. The money that he had was not because he had a job, but because people contributed to his ministry. Not someone that we would look at as having authority. But when you hear the words of Jesus, you're marveled. When you hear, or when you see the things that Jesus can do, you stand in amazement. When you see how Jesus treats others, you're in awe. And so the centurion saw something different about the authority of of Jesus. And so he goes to him and he asks him and he begs him, please help my servant. Say the word and let my servant be healed. And he obviously knew something of the notoriety of Jesus and the healings that he had performed. He may not have, have seen anything, but he knew that Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't even have to enter my house. Jesus doesn't have to see him. Jesus doesn't have to touch him. Jesus, all he has to know is that my servant is sick and he needs to be healed, say the word. And it happens. This man trusted in the power and the ability of Jesus. Jesus is looking for a faith that trusts not in ourself, not in our ability, but trusts in the ability of Jesus. And Jesus can do great things with a faith that simply trusts. And acts. The man with the greatest faith in all of Israel wasn't a Jew. It was a Gentile, a Roman centurion who had heard of Jesus, knew something about Jesus, trusted in what he had heard, and simply asked Jesus to help. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? To us, 
doesn't sound that amazing. But to God, he marveled at that kind of faith. The Hebrew writer said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's a faith that causes Jesus to marvel. What about your faith? Tomorrow morning when you wake up, Lord willing, we walk by faith. We trust Him in His Word. Will you, uh, will, will you be motivated to do the things that you do by love? Will you work to intercede on the behalf of others? Will you go throughout the day clothed with humility and genuinely trust in Jesus? And walk by faith and not by sight. Sometimes, I think we make it a little more complicated than it really is. God just asked us to live by faith and trust Him. And shouldn't we have learned the lesson by now? We know that when we trust in ourselves, all we do is just mess it up. Let's be determined to walk by faith and not by sight. And when you do that, you'll possess a faith that causes the God of heaven to marvel. This evening, I don't know where you are in your walk of faith. I don't know um, how God is at work in your life. Maybe you feel like He's been silent. Maybe you see His presence in the way that He's working. Whatever the case is, walk by faith. And not by sight. Maybe tonight you need to respond to the invitation. Maybe, maybe faith has been a struggle for you right now. Maybe you're in one of those low points where it's been a struggle. I understand that. We all go through that. And you need to come back to Him. Maybe you're ready to put your faith in Him for the very first time through obedience to the gospel. Whatever your need is, we would love to help you walk through it. Please come forward while we stand. And while we sing.